Thanks, Jake. I was a little uh, surprised this morning. Uh, my wife's been out of town for a while, and I, I walked out to the table, and there was a gift and a card on the dining room table. I was really impressed with my boys. So I, you know, they came out a little while later, and I was kind of excited to open it, and they said, yeah, Dad, if you behave yourself all day after dinner, we're going to let you open that gift up and read the card. <laughs> Don't you hate it when they uh, use your own playbook against you? Well, uh, anyway, I was, I was uh, thinking about Father's Day and graduations this week, and I just pulled up a few old videos of my boys that are about 10 years old. This, is, this first video is a, a video of my son, Caden, and uh, I'll throw that up there. What did you do? Where are you stuck? I'm stuck in a cage. What cage? I need to stick on my mouth. The... <laughs> Isn't that so cute? He, my, my youngest has just always been an adventure. We never know what he's going to do. And when we put up this rabbit cages in our backyard, he was just convinced that he was going to sleep out there with the rabbits till his hair got stuck in the cage. But anyway, that's, that was my son, Kate, about 10 years ago. And this is my son, Noah, about 10 years ago. I'm about to go quad biking. Oh, yeah. Let's see a tough biker look. Grr, where's your girl fit? Yeah. <laughs> when I went through the family videos, he is just the narrator of everything, e explaining everything that's taking place. And it, it'd be fun to look back at those. I was feeling a little nostalgic this week. Uh, my oldest son is starting high school next year, and my youngest son is going to middle school. Now, just to explain to you guys, I'm not old enough to have a high schooler. Uh, it's just by a technicality, okay? So I'm just, just telling you. And uh, when you see him out on the courtyard today, um, no, he is not as tall as I am. I'm just slouching. So just remind me to stand up straight so I can use that quarter or eighth or tenth of an inch over him as long as I can. Uh, but it's Father's Day, and uh, it really does fly back by, doesn't it? Doesn't it go fast? Um, I was just thinking about the questions that are asked around the dinner table. Now, again, I'm, I'm at that age where if they actually have their mouths empty for five seconds, um, the questions are pretty profound. But it, it, it kind of it gets tougher each year, the questions that they ask around the table. You know, when they're little, when they're that age, it just starts out with, you know, why can't I do that, Dad? And, you know, as dads, we have, we're full of wisdom. We say stuff like, because... I told you so, that's why you can't do that. You know, then the, the questions, they, they evolve. You know, they, they see things on the news, they, they, they hear things at school, and they, they, they ask questions like, Dad, why do people do bad things? You know, in the depth of our fatherly wisdom, we say things like, well, because. You know, we ask explain things. And, and a few years go by, and, you know, they, they start asking, well, well, Dad, why should I do the right thing if no one else is, is, is doing the right thing? You know, we say, because. And, you know, eventually, and this is a question, it's not just a question that you hear from your kids. It's a question you hear from your kids, from your grandkids, even from people that you encounter in and out of the church. People ask the question, why do the wicked prosper? Isn't there a point in everyone's life where we ask that question? Why does it seem like the people who are doing the wrong thing, why does it seem like they are winning? Why should we do the right thing? And the people who do the wrong thing are always winning. All of us want to know the answer to this question at some point in our life. And today it's going to be addressed in Psalm 37. And as we go through this, most, most of our psalms are, are songs and they're hymns and they're, they're choruses of praise. Uh, but today this psalm feels more like it should be in the book of Proverbs because it's a, a wisdom psalm. And, and our author is dealing with some of life's biggest questions. He's dealing with life and death, wisdom and folly, reward and punishment. And in our passage today, he's going to clearly address this question, why do the wicked prosper? And there's a similar question that, that's somehow related. It's why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good? I'm, I'm doing the right thing, but it just seems like the world is always punishing me. You ever had someone ask that question or ask that question yourself? Well, he's going to address those today. And so we're going to begin in verse 1. Psalm 37 says this, Fret not yourself because of evildoers, and do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. 
You know, one of his primary points in this entire psalm is that we should not be jealous of evildoers because their day is coming. We should not be jealous of people who do what's wicked, of people who do what's wrong because their day of punishment is coming. He's telling us, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't be jealous of them. Don't sit around and, and try to think of punishments for someone who is not under your authority. God is telling us what he has in store for evildoers. Doesn't it seem like it was just three weeks ago that all of the hillsides around were green? Do you know why it seems like it was just three weeks ago? It was. It was just perfectly green and beautiful three weeks ago, and now all that grass is just dry and welcome to the desert wasteland of San Luis Obispo County. And he's saying that the evildoers, they fade like the grass. It looks like they're receiving a reward, but don't worry, their day is coming. And, and throughout this passage, he just tells us what happens to people who do its evil. So I'm just going to cherry pick from a, a few verses here. We're going to start out in, in, uh, in verse 9. It says, the evildoers, they will be cut off. Then in verse 10, it says, in a little while, these evildoers, the wicked, they will be no more. In verse 13, it says, the Lord laughs at the wicked. He sees that his day is coming. In verses 14 and 15, it says that the wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and the needy, to slay those whose way is upright, and their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. Their weapons that they use to oppress the weak will be used against them. Verse 17 says the arms of the wicked will be broken. You know, you often hear that. People say, I just want to go break his arm or break his leg. Son's doing something evil or wicked. It says, verse 17, their arms will be broken. Verse 20 says, the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastors. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Does this sound like a description of people we should be jealous of? Should we be envious of the wicked when it says that they're going to be cut off, that there'll be no more, that God laughs at them, that their weapons are going to be used against them, that they'll perish, that they'll vanish? Are these people that we should be jealous of? No way. Their reward is so short-term. Friends, instant gratification through evil means often seems like it has a short-term benefit, but it has no long-term gain. Let me say that again for you. Instant gratification through evil means often seems like it has a short-term benefit, but it has no long-term gain. Instant gratification does not pay off. It may look like the wicked are winning, but the final score of life will always show that they lost. You know, oftentimes you're, you're talking to someone and, and they're, they're, they're telling you about something stupid or foolish that they're about to do. Someone comes up and says, you know, I know it's the wrong thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. You ever hear people say something like that? And, and in your mind, you just want to scream, no, don't do it. We know what that, that, that wrong thing is, right? It's, it's a pretty long list. I mean, it's, it's I'm going to leave my family. I'm going to start drinking again. I'm going to cheat my boss. He deserves it. The list, the list goes on and on. You know the, the list. And, and people say, you know, I know it's the wrong thing to do. I know I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. They say that because they've bought into the lie that this instant gratification has a long-term gain. It doesn't. It doesn't. The reward disappears in an instant. And so... Throughout this passage today, he's going to explain to us what the reward of the righteous is, and he's going to explain to us how we could be righteous and how we could remain righteous. And so in, in verse 3, the psalmist says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. The, the second main point of this, this psalm is continue to trust God. Your day is coming. Just as there's a day for the evildoers when they will be punished, there's a day for the righteous when they will receive their reward in full. And Psalm 37 is filled with promises for those who trust God, even in a day of evil. 
Even in the day when it seems like the wicked are winning, there is a reward. And he continues on this path, this, this idea of what we need to do to remain righteous in verse 4. And verse 4 is probably the most famous verse of this entire psalm. If, if you love Psalm 37, you, you probably have spent time dwelling on this one verse. It says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desire of your heart. Saying, when our hearts align with God's heart, we will not be disappointed. His point here is that the righteous find their joy in God. The righteous find their joy in God. They don't seek satisfaction apart from him. They find it in him and through him. You know, John Piper made an entire writing career off this one verse. He, uh, in, in his uh, book, Desiring God, he says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. When we say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to find my joy in what God has to offer. I'm going to seek my joy in God's promises, and I'm not going to try to find my joy in what the world has to offer. It says that he's glorified, and we're completely satisfied. That, that, that satisfaction, that, that idea of like, like after just a great meal, how you just feel good, it tasted good, it felt good, you just feel satisfied. He's saying that satisfaction that we long for as human beings, it comes from tying our joy to God. The wicked are looking for instant gratification through evil means, but the righteous find their satisfaction in being aligned with God and his promises. And so he continues to say in verse 5, he says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as light and your justice as the noon day. You know, verse 6 is a really important one to hang on to. Have you ever done the right thing and been accused of doing something that's wrong? You ever had people make false accusations against you? Question your character, question your motives, slander you in different ways? He says, for the righteous, he brings forth their righteousness to light and their justice as the noonday. His promise here is that the righteous trust God even when they're persecuted even when there's false accusations against them. The righteous trust God. This is often the hardest thing to do in life is to trust God. Oftentimes we want to defend ourselves or to protect ourselves or to make things right for ourselves. And he's saying, no, the righteous, they simply trust God. You know, if, if we've committed our way to God and we're choosing to walk on his path and choosing to do what he says, we don't need to defend ourselves or to protect ourselves. We just need to allow our character, the testimony of others, and most importantly, God's testimony to defend us. The righteous trust God at all times. In verse 7, he continues to instruct us how to be righteous. He says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. The third thing that the righteous do is that the righteous wait for God. As I said before, you know, in this game of life, it often looks like the other team is winning, but you always wait for the final score. Now, a year ago, I did one of my most favorite things with my sons. I took them to a Dodger game. Not a baseball game, I took them to a Dodger game, all right? I love going to Dodger Stadium. And uh, going to Dodger Stadium is really interesting. Usually, there's 5,000 people there at the end of the game. There's 50,000 people there by the third inning. And if the Dodgers are losing, there's 5,000 people in the stadium at the end of the game. All right? I mean, that's just how LA fans are. It's just how it goes. And it was a miserable game. It was slow. It was boring. There weren't any home runs. And the Dodgers were losing. And my sons were begging to me. They said, Dad, everyone's leaving. Can we just go? No, we can't go. And, and there's, there's about 5,000 people left in the stadium, and I put on my preacher boy's voice, and I began to tell my sons the stories of how I fell in love with Dodger baseball. It was 1988. I don't know why, but the World Series was on the TV in my parents' house, game one. I probably had never watched a baseball game in my life up until that point, and I married a very educated guest that I should cheer for the Dodgers because they were blue, and my favorite color at the time was blue. Makes sense, right? 
So anyway, I am cheering for the blue team, 1988, and the blue team is losing throughout the entire game. And I don't know how I had the patience to stick with this game as a little kid, but I'm just watching and watching. I probably just didn't want to go to bed. Anyway, I'm watching this Dodger game, and we're down to the bottom of the ninth inning. Two outs, runner on second, and they send this old man, Kurt Gibson, to come limping up to the plate. And, and literally, he looks like they should push him up in a wheelchair. And, and he is facing the best reliever in all of baseball, Dennis Eckersley, you know, sidearm, sinker ball thrower. He's whipping it up there, mid-90s, and you think, this guy can't even walk. He doesn't have a chance. It goes to a full count, okay? So it's three and two, two outs, bottom of the ninth, Dodgers are going to lose, the A's are going to go on to sweep the series, all right? And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Kurt Gibson just smacks the ball into the right field pavilion. The crowd goes wild. You know, Vin Scully is going, in the year of the improbable, the impossible has happened. And Kurt Gibson is pumping his fist as he's rounding the bases. And you know what I remember about that story? If you watch the replay, you know what you see? Brake lights. Because some Dodger fan was dumb enough to leave a World Series game early and he had the radio on, and he realized that he missed out the greatest moment in Dodger history by leaving the game early. And so I told my sons right there at that game, I said, boys, that is why we never leave a baseball game early. What's the bottom of the ninth? One on, Howard Kendricks is on first base, Yasiel Puig comes up, and you get, if you're a Dodger fan, you know he stunk last year, and he did, all right? He's up at the plate, and he hits this little league ground ball up the middle past second base. And the center fielder, who had struck out five times that day, comes running in to scoop up the ball, and he's going to throw out Howie Kendrick at second base and catch him loafing on the bases. And in little league style, he scoops, and the ball goes right past him all the way to the wall, and Puig can run. And he goes sprinting around the bases, dives headfirst in a home plate, and my boys are going nuts. Yeah! And they're going wild. And I said, that's it. That's why you never leave a game early. I should have gotten father of the year right there for that timing of that story. I have never had impeccable timing on a story like that one right there. I, I should have gotten, I didn't get father of the year last year, just missed out. But uh, friends, don't leave the game early. There are so many people who have come through the doors of this building and other churches, and they have followed God for seasons. There's been seasons where they walk faithfully with God, but there's a point where they say, you know, I know it's the wrong thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Friends, that is a very short-term gain with no long-term reward. The righteous wait for God, and they stay in till the end of the game. The point of that story was not to put your faith in the Dodgers. Ever since Gibson hit that home run, it's been 29 years of disappointment and heartache. <laughs> the point of the story is, in the game of life, we wait for the final score. And the final score of this life will re reveal that the righteous win and the wicked lose. God's keeping score goes on in verse 11 he says but the meek shall inherit the land delight themselves and delight themselves in abundant peace in verse 18 it says the lord knows the days of the blameless and their heritage will remain forever they are not put to shame in evil times for those blessed by the lord shall inherit the land the point of all these is that the righteous delay gratification the righteous delay gratification Delayed gratification pays off in full. I get a, a weekend reader. It's a, it's a retirement reader. It teaches, you know, teaches guys like me who don't understand finances that well how to think about retirement. And it had a great story in it this weekend. It said, right now, currently in the U.S., 40% of 20-year-olds are cashing out their 401ks. 40% of 20-year-olds do not believe in their retirement accounts. They do not believe that the money will be there, so they are cashing out to buy cars and to buy houses. And so he ran the math in this article. I didn't do the math. This is straight from a guy who understands finances. He says, if a 25-year-old 
has $10,000 saved up for retirement by their 25th birthday. They're doing good. $10,000 by your 25th birthday, pat yourself on the back. You're doing good. If you cash that out on your 25th birthday after taxes and penalties, you'll probably end up with $5,000. 5000 But if you just leave that $10,000 sitting there and you don't touch it, you do not add anything to it, you don't, you don't even add in a penny, you just let it grow, 8% a year, compound interest, by your 65th birthday, you'll have over $200,000. So if I told you today that I could give you either $5,000 or $200,000, which one would you take? 40% of people would take $5,000. Isn't that crazy? Friends, delayed gratification goes completely contrary to the thinking of our culture. We are a culture of instant gratification. We are one-click shoppers. We, we, we can go on Amazon and have anything delivered to our house within two days. One day if you want to pay a little extra. We are all about instant gratification. And he's telling us here that the righteous delay their gratification. You know, last weekend, um, there was a funeral service here uh, for Barbara Cronk. Probably the funniest service you've ever been to if you've been to a, a memorial service. Because the Clark family, from Bob to Barbara to Roger, three great humors right there in that family. They, they, they just, their dinner tables must have been hilarious. But uh, they were telling stories and stories and, and just funny Barbara stories. And it, it, it all wrapped up. And, and Roger stands up for the, the final word. And he says, you know, we, we, we joke a lot about my mom. You know, she, she made her own clothes. She lived very simply. You know, she lives in a Tascadero area with no air conditioning for, for all these years. Everything, when you go in her house, is very simple and basic. She lived a simple life. He said, but the greatest blessing for me as a son is she used a checkbook for all those years. And she, he said, I, I found 40 years of her checkbooks. He says, I opened up her checkbook, and inside it was, it was 2 Corinthians 9, 7, that God loves a cheerful giver. And he says, I could see 40 years of my parents' faithfulness. And he says, right now, I know my parents are re receiving their reward in full. Just what, what a testimony is that? that? That testimony of delayed gratification seeing your treasure as being in heaven, not here on earth where rust and moth can destroy. Verse 23 goes on. He says, the steps of a man are established by the Lord he, when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he will not be cast headlong. The Lord upholds his hand. Verse 39, it says, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. He's saying right here that the righteous have God's full attention. Even when we fall down, God's there to pick us up. Even when we can't stand on our own, he's there to hold our hand. The righteous have God's full attention. You know, there's a, there's a period of life when every kid has their parents' full attention. It's that period where the child is learning how to walk and they're fascinated with swimming pools. Parents, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know what it is, but it's like the child learns how to walk and then the child wants to walk straight in the swimming pool. And so when you are sitting by the pool with a small child, you are not glued to your cell phone. You are not glued to your book. You do not have your back to the pool. When you watch, especially first-time parents, when you watch them near the pool, they're, oh, oh, you know, they want to give their child freedom. You know, they want, you want to give them their independence, but they want to be there to catch the child. But slowly over the years, you know, we, we start looking down at our book. We start looking down at our cell phone. We start looking it away. Friends, God's not looking down at his phone. We have his full attention. When you fall down and when you feel like he's not there, he's right there. He's holding your hand. His presence is so calm and peaceful, we don't even know it, but we have God's full attention. The, the third and final point of this entire psalm 
very fitting for Father's Day. And there's a great passage in here from verse 25 to 29. Third point is that how we live today sets a path for our children. How we live today sets a path for our children. Look at verses 25 to 29. He says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Turn away from evil and do good. So you shall dwell forever. The Lord loves justice and he will not forsake his saints. They are... Uh, preserved forever but the children of the wicked shall be cut off the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever man look at that children of the righteous are never begging for bread they're provided for but the children of the wicked they're cut off friends we have a clear responsibility with our children now for most dads, especially on Father's Day, when they hear a message like this, a lot of times they feel a bit beat up. You know, like, okay, yeah, the pastor told me again, I gotta be some spiritual giant. I gotta be Billy Graham in my home. I, I've gotta, I, you know, I've gotta, I've gotta preach the Bible to my kids. I've gotta counsel them according to Scripture. I've gotta discipline exactly how the Bible says that. And, and guys start looking at all these have-to-do things And for most guys, they just throw their hands up in the air and say, no, that's too much, I can't do it. They say, no, that's that's too much, why even try? Men, here's the truth. Most guys are not good with words. Most guys do not have something timely to say to their children when their children do something that's wrong. But guys, more is caught than taught. More is caught than taught. Your kids are watching you. If you are walking with God and in God's ways, your kids are seeing a living testimony. And if you are walking away from God, you are leading your kids down a path that leads to destruction. You're leading them in a way of foolishness. So guys, more is caught than taught. Don't choose instant gratification. Don't choose to follow the wicked because your kids are choosing to follow you. Dad, stay in the game. You, you might be losing right now. If, if we brought a scorecard to your home, you'd, you'd probably give yourself a, a losing score. Stay in the game. Your kids are watching some of you, your, your kids are out of the house. Oh, this doesn't work for me. My kid's, you know, 20s. He's gone. He's out of the house. I'm, I'm 37 years old. I'm still watching my dad. I still know what he's doing. We watch our parents till the day they die. Just as they watch us, we're watching them. So it doesn't matter if your dad, grandpa, great-grandpa, stay in the game. Your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, they're watching. And they need a role model. They need to see a man who walks with God. Some of you might say, well, I didn't have a role model. I didn't have a man I could follow. Good, be the first one your family's ever had. Break that chain in your family change the pattern, change the direction of your family for generations. Just start walking with God. Get on God's path and you will put your kids on God's path. Keep being faithful. Friends, today, we just looked at something that is completely radical, that it's something that is just completely countercultural. And it's this idea that there is something better worth waiting for. Our world wants to tell you that everything you want, need, or desire can be had now. And they're making it easier and easier for us to get it. Delayed gratification pays off in full. The righteous trust God, and they wait for God because they know their reward is coming. Let's stay on his path. Let's pray. 
God, uh, I'm just so grateful for the dads who are in this room today. I'm grateful for my dad. And I'm grateful for you, Lord, that you are a loving and perfect father. God, I just pray that we would be a generation that chooses to follow after you. That we would be a generation that lives contrary to the rest of the world. It's countercultural. That we would be a beacon of light to our community and a beacon of light to our kids. God, as we uh, give our, our offering right now, Lord, we're just reminded that our reward's coming. We're not seeking it here now, but we're waiting for a reward that's stored up with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Yours is 
on that cross of Calvary. My boys think it's pretty funny that I have to wait till dinner to get my present. But that's, that's short-term, guys. That's a short-term game. I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. I cannot buy them a ticket to heaven. But I can walk faithfully with the Lord and put them on the right path and pray that they choose to stay on it. 
Men, let's put our kids on the right path. Let's give them the start they need and let's cheer them on every step of the way. God bless you and have a great week.